Good afternoon, Central Florida First. My name is Pastor T.L. Brisbane from High Ground Church of God in Christ. And in my other job, I serve as the Vice President of Community Lending for BBVA Bank. And today I bring you greetings. Uh, we have a wonderful financial workshop that we're getting started with that's going to be presented by BBVA and sponsored by BBVA. And hopefully it's going to share some information with you that's beneficial. Today, our financial workshop is considering home ownership. And so this workshop is for those that are in the process of home ownership, those who have been thinking about it, trying to figure out how to work up toward home ownership, and those that just want more information about considering home ownership. And so I promise you to get in every detail about owning a home and the process of it. We could be in a course for nearly eight hours, and I know I only have an hour of your time, so I'm going to make sure that it's beneficial to you. And so we have three workshop goals that we really want to go over in this whole process. The one is we want to review the costs and responsibilities associated with home ownership. Two, we want to explore the loan repayment process. And three, learn how to find out if you're financially ready to own a home. So one of our first exercises we're going to do is pro or con. And I'm going to list out four things about home ownership. And I want you to answer these questions for yourself. Is it a pro or is it a con? Number one, a home has loan term value. Number two, you need to make payments toward a home. Number three, you need to pay taxes on a home. And number four, you can remodel a home any way you like to. And so when we think about that, those four questions that we put ahead of you, just to let you know, uh, number one, a home has long-term value. I reply, and I tell people this all the time, there's no company in the world making land. So you own a home, you own a piece of this rock that we call earth. Values may sway, they may dip, they may go around, but eventually they come back up. Just a prime example, I think about all the time that my parents bought their home back in 1971 for $12,000, and now their home is worth over $200,000 to this day. And so you have to think about it. It does have long-term value, value that can be passed on to heirs or that can be sold later on to pull your equity out of that property. All right, the second one was you need to make payments toward a home. And I tell people this, you have to pay to stay somewhere. Whether you're renting or whether you're paying a mortgage, you're going to pay. And so, yeah, you know, it may, you know, you think it may be a, a con to have to pay. I mean, I wish everyone could stay for free, but it just doesn't happen like that in this world. So you have to pay to stay. So I would say that is a pro because eventually the payments that you make toward home ownership will benefit you in the long run. Just to give you an example of that, when you're making those payments toward rent, you're dropping that money into a pit, a black pit where you can never pull anything out. When you leave, that money stays there. But when you're paying money toward a mortgage, those payments that you put in, when you get ready to move and sell that property, you get to pull those out. That is your equity that you've earned over that time by making those payments. So to me, it is a pro. Number three, you need to pay taxes on a home. Uh, for some people, they say it's a pro because I get to be involved in my city government, make sure that money that I'm paying in my taxes help beautify my community and my schools and those things around me. Some may say it's a con because they're like, well, the politicians that we have in my area spend money crazy and I just don't like what they do. So for you, it may be a con. And then the way that that price goes up or down in your community, you may see it as a con as well. But in my mind, I think it's a pro being able to give back to my community and make sure those things around me look the way that I want them to look. The last one, you can remodel your home any way you like. Overwhelmingly, this is a pro, especially when we talk about the wives you know, and, and the husbands. You're going to have a lot of honeydew lists to do uh, because you understand that, that you can remodel and do anything you want to the home that you own. When you're renting a home, the most the landlord may let you do they may let you paint a couple of walls, change a few colors that way, but you cannot do something that materially affects or change that property. But when you own a home, you can do whatever you want to do to that home. Per your HOA or per the city guidelines, you can paint it, you can take a wall down, you can add a bathroom to it, you can close in a garage. You can do anything you want because it's your property and you can make it suit your needs and make it as comfortable as you possibly can. So let's think about some common terms. And I know some of the common terms that I'm going to say, they seem really easy to, to grasp, but I really want to give you some details behind it. 
And I want you to have these common terms. So when you're in a bank, when you go before a lender, that you'll understand that jargon that they're speaking about when they're talking about your loan or the application process that you're getting yourself into. One is income. Income is money earned from wages or from fixed income. Social security benefits, uh, child support or alimony, pension plans, whatever the case may be, those are considered income. Income history. When we look at income history, we just want to see over a period of time, at least 24 months, that you've been making a consistent income so that we can look at that income history to make sure that that income isn't dipping or declining, but it's staying the same or maybe increasing. So we always look at your income history. Number three, debt to income ratio. This is a biggie that a lot of people struggle with because they can't understand. They say, I pay all of my bills on time. I do this, but I got denied for my debt to income ratio. See, the government requires that we keep you at a comfortable debt to income ratio. Just to give you square numbers of what that looks like. If you make $2,000 a month, all your bills combined, including this new mortgage, we want them to total up to $860 or less. And a reason being, if you're at 43% debt to income ratio, God forbid something bad were to happen, a catastrophic injury, loss in job, cut hours at your job, whatever the case may be, at 43%, you're able to maintain your responsibilities until you get back on your feet. But if you're above 43 or maybe even above 50%, and then you lose your job, catastrophic injury, anything like that were to happen, then you go into default because it'll be just too hard for you to keep up with all those responsibilities because you got yourself so in debt. And so we want to make sure that you're at a comfortable rate. I tell people all the time, if you can avoid being at 43%, I would try to get my debt to income ratio as low as I possibly can because that means more income I'm taking home and less than I'm giving out to those that I owe. Credit score. Credit score is another thing. Credit score is a three-digit numerical score that the credit bureaus come up with to show or reflect your credibility. I had a young lady that sat across from me some years ago, and I asked the question. She was like, what is a credit score? I said, what do you think a credit score is? She said, I think it's a number that the devil came up with to keep me from having anything. And I, and I told her, I said, no, nah, we're going to dispel that myth in your mind right now because you can control your credit. You can have better credit. You just have to begin to do better things with the finances that you have. Down payment. Down payment is a lump sum of cash used to pay part of that, of that home price. And it shows the lender that you're committed to the process. Not only that, it's your skin in the game. All right, now we're going to go over something that all bankers will tell you, whether it's commercial lending, whether it's residential lending, whether it's retail lending. If there are five C's of credit. Number one is your capacity, your present and future ability to meet your payment obligations. That's your capacity. Number two is your capital, your assets, including your cash, your savings, your retirement, any large purchases that have cash or liquid value to them, investment properties that you have, or anything that you have that can be liquidated to put cash in your hand, we consider that your capital. Collateral. Collateral is the property or asset that you offer up to secure a loan. So when you're getting a mortgage, your collateral will be that home that you're purchasing. That's your collateral that you're offering up to secure that loan. So barring that nothing goes wrong or if anything goes wrong and you're unable to pay, the bank has that collateral that they can get to try to be made whole again. Character, that's a big one. Sometimes people leave the character out, but character is really big. Your history of delivering to your commitments. Meaning, do you pay as agreed? Do you stand on your word that you put forth and say, I'm going to do this? A lot of times I think we have the intention to do so, but sometimes we wane off of those commitments. But it shows your character. So character is one of the C's. And the last C, conditions. The purpose of the loan or fight is that may affect your ability to repay. Making sure that all the conditions that are around you are suitable for you to pay off this loan. Meaning that one condition that would be a good condition, meaning that I have a stable job, stable income, uh, I want to be in this community, I have no problems, I'm doing what I need to do, then my conditions are very well. If I have an unstable job, I have unstable income, I'm unstable about where I'm at and what I'm doing, then my conditions are bad and I may not be ready for home ownership. So we have to make sure we have that intact when we think about this. So one of the other things that I like to talk about a lot 
is creating a financial action plan. And I tap in a lot on your spending. Uh, because really, if you can see how people spend, you can see how they live. Uh, yeah, I know I know. some of you say, I got that. I, ca I caught it. Yeah, if you can see how people spend, you can see how they live. And so one thing that I tell people, especially if you're considering home ownership, you need to start preparing things for home ownership. And one thing that you need to do is look at your spending that you do now and make sure you curb some of that frivolous or unnecessary spending in order so you can save more money up for down payment, for closing costs, uh, for enhancements to your property, or just to have that rainy day fund set. But you need to get in a mindset of saving and changing your spending habits. And one thing I tell people a lot years ago, and I may be dating myself with this, but any of those, any of you out here that 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 went to a a home buyer's course, a first time home buyer course in the nineties, or you know, remember they used to tell us to come and you had to get a shoe box, and they said, okay, come back in thirty days, and we want you to put every receipt of everything that you spent over this past thirty days. We want it in that shoe box. And, you know, at first when I thought about it, I was like, these people are crazy. What are we doing that for? What did that have to do with home ownership? And then we came back that month and then everybody had their little shoe box. We looking at each other like, oh, I got a shoe box, man. And we're thinking about that. And then they told us, hey, now we want you to open that shoe box. We want you to pull out every receipt, write it down and begin to add it up. And once we begin to do that, the faces in the crowd just were like, huh? Well, I mean, I remember somebody saying, dude, I don't believe I spent that much money on clothes in one month. Uh, I remember somebody saying, I don't believe I eat out this much. But once they started looking and tracking their spending, they were able to see those areas that they could curb some of that frivolous spending in. I tell people a lot of times, one of the smallest things that we think is small can okay, really have an indent in our pockets. If, if, if you work outside of the home, the cheapest lunch meal that you're going to find if you don't bring your own lunch is about five bucks. Well, it doesn't seem like a lot. It seems pretty minuscule in, in, in the grand scheme of things, but think about it on a weekly basis. Five days a week, five dollars a day. That's twenty-five dollars a week. That's a hundred bucks a month. That's twelve hundred bucks a year that I'm spending on lunch when I could be saving this money up to do something different. And I said five dollars. So I know a lot of you that are on here, you spend 10, 15 bucks. And don't forget about my Starbucks people. You can't even step foot in Starbucks without spending five bucks. But if you think about the rate and the time that you're doing these things, it can add up and begin to eat in your pockets. So you have to make sure you're able to curb some of those spending habits that you have. I know that sometimes we look nice and we want to have haircuts and that. Sometimes you have to curb even some of those things in order to save up to have money prepared for you to buy a home. I tell people a lot of times, think about the level of importance to you. If it's more important on you to look fly and to rent an apartment, keep doing that. But if it's more important for you to look nice and own a home, then that's what you do. Then you start to make those differences and those changes that are beneficial to you, your life, and your legacy for those that are behind you. So start watching your spending. Make sure that you, you really tally out what your needs are and what your wants are. And make sure that your needs take priority over your wants. Start looking at your wants and mark off what you can live without. And this will help you in tracking your spending and get to a better, a better financial footing as you get prepared to own a home. Debt to income ratio. This is something that we look at a lot. And I want to make sure that you understand this and really got a grasp but can figure out what your debt to income ratio is. And so one way to do this is, let's do this. What is your monthly income? So you want to have your monthly income. And then you want to get your monthly income. My monthly income, just say it, my monthly income is X amount of dollars. And then you want to have your total monthly expenses. My total monthly expenses is X amount of dollars. So this is the calculation that you want to use to come up with your debt to income ratio. And remember, the only debts that we're able to see are those that show up on your credit report. Those that show up on your credit report and then other things like your home insurance and your taxes that may not show up on your home on your on your credit report but are important in order for us to be able to look at your debt to income ratio. And so when we think about this, let's give you the equation. The equation is this, and I'm giving you flat numbers. My 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 bills I pay out every month are a thousand bucks, 
and my my income I make every month is four thousand dollars. Well, you're at twenty five percent debt to income ratio, meaning that you're at a great percentage to go and buy, and you can really afford to add a home onto your equation. But you want to make sure that you're doing that. And so look at the equation: your expenses divided by your income, and that's going to come up with your debt to income ratio. Normally, that equation it will come out like point. Four, two, five, or something like that. What you want to do is you want to take the first two digits and put a decimal point right there, and then it'll be point. It'll be forty-two point five percent. That will be your debt to income ratio. So hopefully that gave you an insight to that. All right, credit score. We really got to tap into credit score. This is one area that hurts a lot of people. This is one area that prevents a lot of people from being able to move to that next level or get to that home or get to the point where they're able to own a home, their credit score, that three digit number that we talked about. There are three major credit bureaus that, that, that comes up with your credit scoring. You have Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. These are the three major bureaus that we look at and that we pull your credit scores from. Your credit score, your credit report, this is one thing that it does. It shows us, it gives us a look into you. I tell people a lot of times, it's a reflection of your credibility. Now, don't get me wrong. I know that some people have had some hard times. We had some issues that popped up and came up that we had to deal with, that, that maybe a bankruptcy or foreclosure or something that's on there. But what did you do after that? Did you correct whatever the problem was and continue to have good credit from that point on? Or did you fall back into that same pattern and continue to have those same bad spending habits, those same bad bill paying habits that keep you in that bad credit zone? So when we look at bad credit or we look at credit levels that we look at, from 500 to 580, you're kind of considered poor credit. From 600 to about 6, uh, 640, you're fair credit. From 650 to 700, you're good credit. Now, from 700 to 750, you're really good credit. You know, once we go to 750 to, to, to 800, now you're on, that, on the point of excellent credit. Now, when you go 800 and above, there's nothing stopping you there. Now, the difference in that is when you have those different credit scores or those different credit score levels, the lower you are, the less options you have. And I'll just go ahead and tell you that up front. That way you'll know that now. And not just with purchasing a home, with everything else that you do. The lower your credit score is, the less options you have. So it's best to have the highest credit score possible so that you can create more opportunities and options for yourself. So when it comes down to mortgage lending, the lower your credit score is, that's usually only one product that can be offered for you. That's FHA. Because it's going to take a lower credit score, maybe a higher debt to income ratio, but you're going to be saddled with mortgage insurance on that product because you're so risky. And But if you're at that 800 mark, oh man, they got a ton of different products for you. You know, really like a, a, a la carte of products for you. It's like a smorgasbord of different things that you can qualify for the better your credit score gets. And so that's why it behooves you to have a, a, a good credit score. A lot of people, and I run into this a lot, it's almost like they're so apprehensive or scared to even find out what their credit score is. They've been told that it was bad one time before. They've been denied for something. So in their mind, their credit is bad. It won't happen. It won't work. And this one, I tell you, you have to know. You have to get engaged with your credit. You have to find out what your scoring is. Now, a lot of times we look at the, these, these two different programs or apps I've heard of. You have Credit Karma. You have uh, Credit Sesame. Now, they're good apps. They're good credit monitoring apps. Now, when it comes to scoring, uh, now compared to one of their scores and an actual mortgage credit report score, you may be off between 15 and 50 points. But it's a great tool to monitor your credit. And the reason why you're off for that, that big difference in, in, in scoring is usually with Credit Karma, Credit Sesame, they're only going back about five years. So it's what we call a retail credit report. Now, if you're going to get a mortgage, that mortgage credit report is going to go back as far as your credit will allow it. So we have a deeper dive, a deeper data set in order for us to look at. And with that deeper data set, it's going to come up with a different score than what a small window data set will come up with. And so that's the difference in it. But these are great tools for you to be able to track your credit. I tell everyone all the time that, that the government has did something for us a few years ago, which is perfect, which is great. 
They've given everyone an opportunity to pull their credit score or to pull their credit report once a year for free. You go to annualcreditreport.com. That's annualcreditreport.com. And you're able to pull your credit score, your credit report there one time a year for free, all three bureaus. And during this COVID environment we've been in, they've been allowing you to do it once a month to be able to look in there and monitor and, and begin to check your, your credit score. So again, credit scores are really important because it works on, uh, again, a lot of different things. Uh, uh, your homeowner's insurance is going to be dictated by your credit score. Your, it, it's a lot of things that goes into your credit score. The kind of rate that you get on your mortgage is going to be dictated by your credit score. Uh, because the lower your score is, the more risky you are. The higher your score is, the less of a risk you are. So you got to look at different ways of being able to improve your score. Don't be scared of it. Find out what's in your credit score. Begin to do the work that's necessary to bring those scores up. All right, home buying costs. Now, those three major categories of home buying costs, down payment, miscellaneous costs, and closing costs. Those are the three major categories that we look at. So when you think about this, your down payment is usually going to be between 3 and 20%. Uh, we know, like again, I told you about FHA with that particular program, they require you to put a three and a half percent down payment. Just using flat numbers, if I'm buying a house at a hundred thousand, my down payment is thirty five hundred dollars. Uh, if I'm buying a house at a hundred thousand and I'm putting down twenty percent, my down payment is twenty thousand dollars. So you want to make sure that you're looking at that and thinking about that, weighing out those options of whether you should put down a bigger down payment a smaller down payment or no down payment at all, you have to look at your own financial picture. What works best for you? Uh, if you have the money to put down and put down a substantial down payment, look at the savings that you will have month over month and then see how long will it take you to recoup that big down payment that you put out. And so sometimes if, hey, I'm putting down 20% and yeah, I'll be recouping that over the next 10 years. And then from that point, it's really going to be gravy for me. That's still a good option to do so. But for some people, most people, that down payment is the biggest hurdle for them. And so the less that they have to put down up front, the better it off it is for them. But always weigh out your option to see that it makes sense for you and it is the best option for you to do so. All right, again, talking about the credit buying costs, miscellaneous costs that you have. You're going to have a credit check uh, cost. You're going to have inspection costs. You're going to have an appraisal cost. Of course, you'll have your earnest money or your binder money that you're going to put down. Uh, and then you're going to have some ongoing costs or recurring costs that you may have. You have non-recurring costs and then you have recurring costs. Some of the non-recurring costs are those things that happen one time and never happen again. Uh, a lot of times there'll be your your title fees, your closing fees. Those are non-recurring costs. They're going to happen at that point of closing and they shouldn't happen again. But some of your recurring costs will be your homeowner's insurance policy and your annual taxes that you'll pay. These are costs that recur because every year you're going to pay another premium and every year you're going to pay taxes on that home. And But let's look at some of your other closing costs. Appraisal fee tax service fees, title fees, government fees. And these are fees, when I talk about government fees and title fees, these go to your recording, where they record your deed downtown. So now that that home is showing that it's your home and you are the rightful and legal owner of that home. So these are expenses that they have. Some other prepaid expenses, again, I told you, property taxes, homeowner's insurance, and interest uh, due the, uh, up until your first payment. So these are some of the closing costs that you would find. Uh, now, private mortgage insurance, I explain this to people all the time. They ask, what is, what is private mortgage insurance or PMI or MI as they call it? It's the insurance that guarantees the lender will be paid the amount of the remaining mortgage if the buyer defaults. So basically, mortgage insurance is selfishly and only for the bank. You know, if you were to go into default, we'll file a claim against your loan and then we'll be able to recoup our funds back. And that's the reason why you pay more in insurance. So who needs it? The person that, that can't have the 20% down payment or the person that seemed to be riskier or you're in a riskier loan or a non-conventional loan. FHA is going to require that you have mortgage insurance 
And the reason being is because they take riskier borrowers. They'll take you with the lower score. They'll take you with a higher debt to income ratio. So to hedge off that risk that they're taking, they require you to pay mortgage insurance in order to protect them and their investment that they have in your home. So anytime you can get out of that, that it's a good thing. So conventional loans, there are two major types of loans. You have conventional and non-conventional loans. So your conventional loans are mortgages and loan products that are provided to people who meet certain criteria uh, with their income level, with their debt to income, with their credit scores. These are loans that are usually provided by financial institutions, banks like we are, credit unions, mortgage companies. Uh, they provide these different uh, uh, options for you. And so let's look at non-conventional. And non-conventional are really going to be your government products. And they're available to buyers who may not have good credit or a large enough down payment or may be these uh, 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 veterans who are, are, are given this benefit for their service that they put forth. So you have FHA, that's a non-conventional mortgage product. You have VA, which is another non-conventional mortgage product. VA offers you 100% financing and it's for veterans, those who have served, those who have uh, have detached or still are attached to the military. Uh, it's a great product. It's going to limit the, the fees that are charged to you. So it's going to be about the, the cheapest cost-wise loan or non-conventional loan that you can find. Then you have USDA. USDA is 100% and in some cases 101% financing. But the only thing about it or the catch to it, you can only use USDA for USDA eligible properties. So depending where you are, depending on what county you are, you, you may be in a county where there, there are plenty eligible USDA properties. Uh, like Alachua County has a lot of uh, USDA, Marion County. Uh, so it's a different parts of town. Duval County, we don't have any USDA eligible areas. Nassau, you have some, St. Uh, uh, John's has a few as well. Uh, so it just depends on where you're at. Bradford County, you have USDA eligibility. And so in those counties, you're able to use USDA to purchase a home. Even though the county may be eligible, it's still going to pinpoint down to your actual property that you're buying. Clay County is another USDA eligible uh, area also, but it's just going to depend on where your property is. You put that information in, you do an eligibility check, and it'll tell you whether you can use USDA with that home purchase, all right? All right, so let's talk about some free resources that are out there. Uh, there. There's the Truth and Lending Act, and this requires that buyers be given all the information, the key figures about their loan, the key features about their loan, uh, three days after submitting an application. You're, you, it's required that you be submitted a loan estimate that gives you all the details of your loan. Everything that's going to happen in your loan is going to give you those details of what you should be looking for cost-wise, uh, interest rate-wise, fees. is going to have it all laid out for you and other disclosures. Then it also requires that you're given a closing disclosure three days prior to actually closing that loan. So three days before closing, you're going to be given a closing disclosure, which are going to give you your final number. See, at the beginning, you're going to get an estimate. At the end, you're going to get a closing disclosure with your final accurate numbers in there. And they're required by law to give you that. Another thing, a free resource for you is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And they provide resources for buyers when financing a home. Uh, you want to look at them. They'll give you different ways of looking at things, also different tools, counseling that you could possibly find before buying a home as well. So it's another free, free resource that you can tap into. And then, of course, you have the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or as we call HUD, and they'll have a lot of different resources for you. Uh, have a fair uh, housing equal opportunity for all. They have information about borrowers' rights. It'll show you or tell you all the the, uh, the HUD certified housing and counselors in your area that can be used to purchase a home. And then also you have USDA. 
and you can go to usda.gov and you can find out a lot of different things of what they offer as far as in purchasing a home and their products. So with that, hopefully now, I told you that this was going to be a, a shorter course because again, we're just giving you just the glossed over details about considering a home ownership and some things that you should think about. And so with this, I want you to remember a few things. It's important that you understand your personal financial readiness before considering home ownership. And when I say that, make sure that you looked at everything. You weighed out all the costs, that it makes sense to you. Make sure that you've curbed any unnecessary spending that you may have been doing before. Make sure you, you're in a process of you've gotten into a, a rhythm or a, a, a plan of saving money on a regular basis, saving for that rainy day. Because as sure as the sun is shining, one day it will rain. And you want to make sure you have savings prepared for that. Also have savings for down payment. Even if you're using a down payment assistance program or maybe using a product that doesn't require a down payment, still get in the habit of saving. Have money. You want to have money saved up. Always want to have some money. So make sure you have some money saved in order to step into this homeowner process really smooth and not have any issues or problems with it. Another thing that you want to do, you want to be sure you understand your personal credit and debt to income ratio. That's why I spent a little time on it because I want you to understand that grasp that I want it to peak or, 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 or I want it to, to spark your interest in finding out more about your credit and your debt to income ratio so that you'll know where you are before you go in to make an application. And if you've already applied at someone and they give you that loan estimate, if you're in the mood or the thought process of shopping to other lenders, which is all well and good, I love it. I tell people to shop me all the time. When I was originating, I'll say, shop me. I'll give you my loan estimate. I'll say, take it to another lender, see if they can beat it or match it. Uh, and that's what you want to do. Instead of letting other people continue to pull your credit, if you're able to get that loan estimate, you're able to shop with that to other lenders to let them know uh, this is what I've been offered at other places. Can you beat it or match it? Uh, and usually I tell them if they can beat it or match it, or if I can't, then I want you to go ahead and stay down there with that lender. But if not, if I got a chance to beat it or match it, I will do so. So we want to make sure that you're doing that. You're understanding the whole process of that and really look at your credit. Take it seriously and importantly. It can really change your life. I've talked to a lot of people over a lot of years. I've been in this industry for 20 years. And I've seen the difference in between those with lower credit and those with higher credit. Personally, you know, it's nothing different between the two people, but financially, they just have a different mindset of looking at things. And then beneficially, the one that has the higher credit always has the better options, the better products, everything that they need. And it's a lot smoother for them, less stress. And it's, I'm talking about for all purchases, auto, car, no matter what it may be, insurance, no matter what it may be, the higher your credit is, the easier it is for you, the more options there are for you, and the process seems a lot smoother. So really pay attention to your credit. If you're thinking about buying a home, really pay close attention to your credit. Try to build up your scores. Try to make it to that 700 club or 700 plus club in order to make it easier for you. Number three. Thoroughly review all costs associated with home ownership before and then before and at the beginning of the process and also at the end. That's why I told you about uh, really looking into those loan estimates and those closing disclosures. Make sure that before you sign, everything lines up with what you've been promised. Make sure everything is as agreed. You want to make sure that stuff is looking the same way. Uh, it, it did when they when they you did your original application and and they told you they locked in that rate. You want to make sure everything is still the same and that the benefits for you are still there. And for the most part, again, I'll tell you this. And I can say this with this: always just seek other accounts. Always pray about things, uh, making sure that you're, you're you're really looking into it the right way. And re don't be on anybody else's time. Uh, remember, home ownership and, and any other goals that you have in life is on its own time. Don't don't be discouraged because someone bought a home before you or someone did something before you. Everything will happen in its right and perfect time. Don't rush it. Don't rush the process. Trust the process, and you'll come out of this thing looking good. So, again, thank you for letting me get this little time from you this morning. 
Hopefully the information I shared with you is beneficial to you in your pursuit to consider home ownership. And again, I'm T.L. Brisbane Sr. Uh, from Higher Ground Church of God in Christ and also from BBVA Bank. And it's our goal to continue to create opportunities in our communities. Thank you and have a great day.